Okay, I think the last topic I wanted to get into for the course this term is just a little bit of a rundown of some of the case studies of classic disasters in software. So looking at some of the things that have gone horribly wrong over the years, maybe a little bit about what happened and thoughts on how we might try and avoid them. The industry does slowly but surely evolve and adapt to the problems that it encounters. Uh, it is a very large industry and you've got a lot of people who've been doing this for a very long time who have their own belief about the right way to do things. And so you're often trying to navigate the best way to improve a business or to improve a process or to improve how you do things in spite of maybe some resistance or while dealing with some resistance from people who like old school ways of doing things. So I want to introduce some of this stuff and just food for thought. Um, this isn't, I don't think, anything I'm particularly going to examine you on, but it's worth knowing about. All right. Uh, what were a few of the ones that I wanted to go through and talk about? Um, so a lot, <laughs> a lot of these are space disasters, funny enough. Uh, Mariner 1 rocket. So looking way back, 62, five minutes after takeoff, it didn't seem to be responding correctly to the guidance from ground control, and they actually had to abort it and destroy it in air. And in this case, it turned out after a fairly extensive review that the problem was actually that they had a set of handwritten notes, formulas on what the on how to control the rocket, and somebody simply misread one of the formulas. Right? There was something handwritten, and there was a superscript that they missed, and then the you know they programmed it according to what they thought the formula was, and of course it was incorrect, and the resulting errors wound up with the, the disaster we got here. So again, this kind of thing, right, this is this is the sort of scenario where you really want the ability to review each other's work and to be careful enough about it, be careful careful enough about the about the communication to make sure you get things like this right. Especially as some, in something as critical as this. Uh, some other examples. Um, oh right Hartford Coliseum collapse. Yes, in uh, uh, again, this was a good 40 years ago. But uh, when designing the roof for a Coliseum, the CAD tools that were in use and the programmer that was using them thought about the design that they had for a roof. So, what kind of pressures are there on the different pieces of the roof, the different supports that are up there? And based on the structure of the roof itself, figured out, okay, you know, these things have to be these strong, this strong, they're going to face these kind of pressures, but never thought about, well, what would, what happens if that assumption isn't valid? What happens if one of those roof supports is gone? Then you've got an entirely different set of pressures on the supports around it, and that wasn't taken into consideration. So when one of them failed, it took down the whole thing, right? Because suddenly you've got Un unanticipated pressures on everything around it. So instead of having kind of a fail-safe where you said, well, we'll account for the possibility that one of these things are, will fail, wasn't done, whole thing came down. Uh, gas pipeline explosion in 82. I don't know if this is confirmed or not. Yeah, the world's largest non-nuclear uh, blast. So the, uh, the theory is that the CIA, in conjunction with the software developers, I think that was actually here in Canada, um, deliberately injected flaws into the control software that would ultimately trigger this blast. Now, I'm not 100% sure how much uh, how valid that is, but you never know. Um, again, different examples of problems in software systems for unanticipated issues. Uh, Soviet early warning system in 83, signaled that the U.S. had launched five ballistic missiles. The duty officer looked at it and said, yeah, no, I don't trust that, I don't believe it, and overruled it and classified it as a false alarm. But what had happened was the software that was running that early warning system 
saw the sunlight reflecting off a bunch of clouds and interpret those, interpreted that as a bunch of missile launches. Again, it's an issue where things that you hadn't anticipated, things that hadn't even crossed your mind or the minds of the designers cause significant issues. Well, this was uh, um, here in Canada as well, I believe. Uh, Therac 29, or 25 rather, in uh, the mid 80s. It was a radiation therapy machine that fired uh, doses of radiation at specific spots on a patient as part of a, a treatment. But what happened was that suddenly they discovered that it was firing in high power modes. The patients were getting massive radiation doses and in some cases fatal doses. Uh, and what actually happened is that there used to be an old physical system controlling the process and they switched to a software system. And it became possible with the new controls for the user to enter commands faster than the underlying system could respond and such settings that were impossible under the old physical system could suddenly get triggered in the new software controlled system which wound up with these sort of race conditions generating massive doses of radiation for individual patients. Again, there are things that you have to consider and test that are not obvious when you're developing software systems. Uh, Black Monday, yeah, the Wall Street crash in 87, huge stock drops. And essentially in this case, it, were, it was computer trading programs doing what they were designed to do. Uh, when they see signs of activity that indicate you could be losing money because a particular stock is dropping, they said, okay, well, we better sell too. But there were no, there were insufficient, let's say, safeguards to protect the system as a whole. And what you wound up with are, you know, different trading programs where this one starts selling and so that one starts selling. So this one sells even more aggressively and that one starts selling aggressively too. And you get this kind of overwhelmed system where everybody is suddenly, all the, these automated systems are trying to sell. You know, eventually wound up with a crash out of that. Again, you get the idea for lots of these different possible approaches. I mean, we're still only up to 1990, and we're just covering the, the barest surface of some of the huge things that have gone wrong. Um, AT&T outage in 1990. Uh, 200,000 airline reservations dropped, a nine-hour outage, 75 million calls missed. Basically, a single faulty switch took down one call center out of 114, but it was set up so that when it came back on, it would notify the ones around it that something had gone wrong. So the switch goes off, comes back up, or rather the center comes back up, and suddenly tells everybody around it, well, ah, there's a problem, shut down. And so they all shut down, and so you wind up with this giant cascading failure again. So this time it's a cascading software failure as opposed to a cascading roof failure, but it's the same idea, right? One failure taking down the ones around it, which take the, down the ones around them, which take down the ones around them, Right? And it was a single line of code, one bug, that wound up causing this massive outage. Um, incorrect rounding, causing a failure of the Patriot missile system. We'll pick up the pace a little bit here. Again, there are a ton of these things. Uh, Pentium chips, so this huge, expensive chip rolled out in the uh, early 90s that actually had a a mistake in its floating point division, so it actually come up with slightly incorrect results in certain scenarios. Um, just missing entries from a table someplace in the chip. Yeah. Hugely expensive, caused a massive loss of trust in the uh, chips at the time. Again, more uh, more rocket failures, where they had to uh, destroy the rocket on its first flight. In this case, they had a 64-bit a velocity that they tried to convert to a 16-bit overflow error. Sent the, they actually had a backup system in place, but the backup system was running the exact same software. So after you get the crash in the domain unit, it flips over to the backup system, which gives you the exact same crash. Right? So redundancy does not always help if the two redundant units do the same thing. 
Uh, another example, so this one's a unit conversion failure. So um, Orbiter in 98 fell into the Mars atmosphere and crashed. And in this case, the problem came because one developer assumed that we were using uh, Imperial units and another, the, the rest of the developers assumed we were using metric, right? So somebody's talking about pounds and somebody's talking about Newtons and there we go. You know, you wind up with uh, incorrect computations because of just basic assumptions on the part of a developer. Giant passport system failures in, uh, in 99. Jeez, we're almost up to the 2000s now. Uh, I'm probably not going to go through this whole list. You get the idea, and you can certainly flip through the slides when you get the opportunity. But um, in this case, it was uh, a lack of testing, a lack of training, and a huge change in the passport laws at the time that saw a system completely overwhelmed by the need for it. Um, there was a, a change in laws that meant about a half a million systems or half a million citizens needed to uh, to replace their passports. And in the short or short, that short time frame that was available, that just wasn't possible with a brand new software system. Yeah. Lots of these things are easily preventable if somebody had spotted the issue. Uh, viruses, right? the, uh, the love virus, one of the, the first big lessons in email security for people. Uh, let's see, poor project management, outdated technology, uh, leads to failed systems where you spend a fortune on a system that is ultimately unusable. And you get cases like this in airlines as well, where you have a, a fortune spent on developing a new in-flight system that turns out to be completely ineffective in the environment it's used in, and so it winds up getting abandoned. You're, you've basically thrown away a ton of money. So I will let you flip through the rest of these at your leisure. Right? Vaporware issues. Again, this is the same sort of idea where we've got uh, um, we wind up spending a, a fortune on different products that never wind up getting finished. Uh, huge problems with software projects going massively over budget. Um, again, bugs and flaws. Oh, this was an entertaining one uh, uh, five or six years ago where. Uh, a fairly minor and easily detectable flaw in some open source SSL software led to a fairly significant error that uh, led to some, some interesting memory scraping on different systems. Um, Heartbleed is definitely a, an interesting one to take some time and read up on if you get the opportunity. The, essentially, the idea was you send a, uh, um, you can send a, uh, message to the server to see if a server is still up and what it will do is copy your message and send it back to you. So this lets you know that the server is actually alive and aware enough to go, okay, yeah, you know, I did actually get your message and I correctly sent you the same message back. But what was happening is you could, essentially you had a struct where you were saying, here's my character array with the message in it and here's an integer saying how big the message is. And if you said the message was really big, but you sent a really tiny one, the server would send you back the tiny message, but it would copy, you know, say you said, said you had a thousand byte message and you only sent a five byte message, it would send you back a thousand bytes of memory. And so it would send you back a big chunk of its memory that wasn't meant for you. And you could start gradually trying to wind your way through the, the memory of these servers and see if there was anything sensitive in that chunk of memory that you just happened to get access to. Lots of interesting bugs and flaws over the years. Um, software recalls, again, just ineffective methods. Um, business shutdowns, right? Have a browse through, see what kind of weird and wonderful things. <laughs> Always fun when bank payments go missing. Right, the use of third-party software. You kind of want to trust your third-party software if you're a bank. Uh, oh, this was an entertaining one. A software that was calculating prison, prison sentences for people actually had a miscalculation in it and let some 3,000 people go early. Not a bad deal if you're one of those 3,000. Um, again, all sorts of interesting things can happen with updates, 
right? If you've got something that auto updates and your auto update goes wrong, that can lead to all sorts of interesting behavior. In this case, going off and uh, draining batteries in systems. And again, more uh, ransomware software in this case. There are lots of examples of really horrific things that have happened over the years and really uh, uh, disastrous software decisions that have taken place. Many of them preventable. Right? Many of them are good lessons to the industry if we can actually adapt to them and respond to them. All right, I will leave it there. Our last session will be to um, just kind of wrap up the course and summarize where we've gone this term. I will leave it there for now. Hopefully none of you are ever part of one of these uh, great disasters in the future.